Okay, I think it is time to start this session. And uh, thank you all for being here. We appreciate that. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, this is a reminder that our session is being recorded. Uh, my name is Meg Milligan, and I will be the moderator for this ideal conference session. Uh, thank you for joining us for Learning at the Ball Game. Three Basic Skills for Managerial and Classroom Success. So please welcome uh, Bill Davis and Marty McCollin. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick and then I'm gonna start with the presentation. And I think everybody can see this, right? Let me go ahead and start the, the, the presentation. Okay. Well, listen, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to present here with my colleague and friend, Dr. Marty, Marty McAuliffe. And um, our topic today is learning at the ball game, three basic skills for managerial and classroom success. This is the 30th annual Adeal Conference. I'm a proud Adeal board member, so it's, it's my pleasure to give back and also, to, again, to team up with Marty. Uh, the theme this year, distance learning moving forward. And hopefully what you walk away with here are a few, few insights or uh, awareness building of <clears throat> some constructs and methods that you can use in the classroom and connect to some things that you already know. So we're gonna hopefully be stimulating some past knowledge, some past experiential learning that you are going to have an opportunity to um, reflect on and also see how that can connect in a classroom. You know, we're all dealing with people, we're dealing with adult learners, students, and, and it's very important that we um, uh, continue to use our, our soft skills, our durable skills, so they have a wonderful, meaningful, and gratifying learning experience. So with that said, I am gonna go ahead and uh, do the introduction page here. And I'm gonna have Marty introduce himself first and then I'll, I'll go ahead. And uh, Marty, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Great, thanks, Bill. And yeah, Bill and I have been working together since 2005 in the education field. We um, will not divulge our ages because we've read the constitution and we understand our fifth amendment rights that we don't actually have to do that. So y'all can just speculate, um, but you know, the higher you go, the more likely you're to be accurate as, as far as our age goes. But I began my professional career as a prosecutor. I spent about three and a half years uh, doing trials and appeals as a prosecutor. And then I transitioned into criminal defense work. And I did that for about seven years. I am the uh, attorney of record for seven published opinions in the state of Arizona. Decided after 10 years of that, that it was important for me to get to know my children. Um, so I transitioned out of uh, trial work and appeals and ended up in education uh, somewhat by happenstance, but I've been teaching online since 2002, which is fairly remarkable because when I transitioned from um, my prosecutor's job and my defense attorney's job, I did not know how to use a computer. I actually dictated all of my memos on a old cassette tape and I would hand them to my secretary or administrative assistant and she would type up the memos and I would do hand edits, hand them back. And uh, it was fairly tedious. And once I figured out computers, I could have saved a lot of time and, and uh, effort. So maybe it would have been so bad to stick with it. But I began here when the criminal justice program started with the University of Arizona Global Campus, uh, Ashford University at that time. Helped develop that course, helped develop a master's program. Uh, I've taught over 300 courses in my career uh, with UAGC. And just excited to be here. Bill and I both have always had a student-focused teaching approach. As Bill will say, I'm sure, and, and I'll reaffirm, you know, we're not here except for the students, and they're the reason we're here, and, and the reason the, the success stories, uh, going through the struggles with the students, seeing them improve, seeing them master their classes, can really, you know, be joyful. Um, that's why we keep doing it, and that's why Bill and I, as long in the tooth as we are, continue to do it. So I'll turn it back to Bill for his introduction. Thanks, Marty. And I want to know, <clears throat> I want you to know and everybody to know that uh, when you get together and you build learning communities and you, you share best practices, you all grow. And one thing that I really admire about Marty, he's always been open to uh, sharing. He's been open to methods and approaches to innovate, improve student success. And, uh, and I've known Marty since 2005 when we both started at the uh, Iowa campus. So, you know, together we've done a lot of teaching. And we've um, supported the university 
and we just continue to grow. We've seen thousands of success stories. Now, my name is Bill Davis. I'm a lead faculty assistant professor in the Ford School of Business and Technology, and I, I just love what I do. Um, Marty and I both left our past careers. You know, I was in the Pepsi Cola uh, business and um, had a long, successful career there for for three over three decades. And <clears throat> anyway, it was highly competitive with a lot of people, customers, but I. I love coaching. I loved seeing people move forward. I loved contributing to their success. So this was a natural progression for me. And, and I've done well, Marty's done well, we all have done well. And it's very meaningful and gratifying to see students have those aha moments and succeed. So that's why I'm here, very purposeful goals. I love the culture of care, love what we do. And we're gonna continue doing that. If you wanna know a little bit more about Marty and I, here are some links to our bios. So with that said, I wanna tell you today's talk, today's insights are based on a short article about three to four minute read. And it's an article that I did with Dr. Jorge Cardenas. And we're gonna add our own personal touch to this. It's a short one. And it's called Learning at the Ball Game: Three Skills for Managerial Success. Now, Marty, Marty and I have added on to that article, you know, just in this presentation, to enhance it more, to enrich it more, to empower the faculty more. And we're going to put a focus on three skill areas, and we'll tell you what those are. But we want to relate them to athletics, to sports, and and help show you the parallels and show you how all this stuff all connects. And then a lot of stuff that you learned early on um, as, a, as a young youngster, teenager, through your career, if you played athletics, et cetera, you've been in gym classes, intramurals, you'll see some connections here and you'll see how you'll notice some of that in the instructors that you have had. And then you'll, you'll also, as an instructor, be able to see maybe I need to be a little more softer here. Or maybe I need to lead more with empathy and compassion, et cetera, because coaches did. So I'm going to leave that here for you. And, and the link is here. Um, we, can, we can put this in the chat if somebody would like to. Now, today's purpose, again, interesting, fun, insightful presentation. Talk about the three skills. Provide some context, which we've already started doing that, you know, stories. Learning and discovery. That's what we want you to do is have an aha moment in here. We, you know, a lot of this is probably redundant for you. You've done it before. You've seen it before. <clears throat> but hopefully this is going to stimulate some thought. And you're going to go, you know, I, I, I walked away with this or that, you know, a takeaway. Something that you can use. Something that's value added. I define value as something that's meaningful and desirable. So that's what the goal. Then uh, some action steps. Obviously, we'll talk about how, you know, here's a suggestion. You might want to apply it, the benefits, how it adds value. And then just some final comments, you know, to close it out, to reinforce these and to show you the kind of benefits and, and reinforce the learning. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Marty. And I'd like Marty to uh, talk a little bit about baseball teams, leadership, teamwork, all that dynamic that exists in teams. And Marty, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Bill. So as you might be able to tell, I am a diehard Boston Red Sox fan. I don't know if there's enough information for you to, to gather if you look at the background, what I'm wearing. But growing up in Boston, if you weren't a Red Sox fan, you'd have a hard time talking to my, you know, most anybody you meet, uh, man, woman, or indifferent. Um, it's basically a, a thread that, that you know, kind of climbs through everything. And as we were talking about this presentation, Bill and I, I realized that one of the things, I have four children, and we had all of them participate in sports uh, and or musical theater. And the, the notion of being a part of something bigger than yourself, being an individual that has to help with others and has to play a certain role, and you have to be able to be adjustable and to, to sometimes sacrifice for the greater good, is really significant. And it goes beyond simply whether your kid was a star athlete or a bench warmer. Um, as they grew up. It's, it's the concepts that you have to learn of showing up on time, uh, showing up for the team, being ready. Uh, if you don't feel great uh, in baseball, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't feel great, you need to show up to the game and do the best you can. A life lesson to learn is that always doing your best doesn't mean being perfect. It means being the best you can in that moment and in that situation. And we have to give ourselves some grace once in a while. And, you know, today I woke up, I didn't feel great. And I uh, was talking to this student and I probably didn't show as much empathy as I should have just because I'm in a bad situation because I have a headache or I'm not feeling well. Things like that we need to, to constantly be aware of. And I think sports teaches us that kind of 
dedication to others, uh, taking a role, taking a subservient role at times and, and working for the greater good. So I think as a foundation for that, we can think about baseball in the classroom and, and what we do in, in teaching online in, in the same vein. Absolutely. Yes, and, and Marty, I, I'd just like to say, you know, together everybody achieves more in a classroom that instructor is a facilitator, is a coach, is an encourager, is a supporter, enriches, empowers at any level, whether it's elementary into college. I mean, there's a, a certain role they play and that connects into sport teams too. If you look at these photos here, the one to the right, you can see a coach here giving encouragement. You can see the smiles in the, in the faces of the, of the girls here that are on the team. You can see it's positive. You can see there's empathy, there's feeling. I mean, you can read what you want to read into these photos. And then if you go to the photo to the left, and these are just young kids that are forming bonds, that are part of a team, that, 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 that are, are happy to be on that team. And so as you look at these, these are somewhat symbolic, in my opinion, as we go through the educational journey to be part of a um, a program to be part of a BA in operations management or whatever your 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 mask your major is to be part of a support group to be part of champs to be part of all the support systems that we have you know I was asked to give a 200 word uh, article why I love teaching for University of Arizona Global Campus and I I if you look on the LinkedIn website and you scroll down it's been a few months but. The one thing that I wrote about wasn't about me or my ego or anything like that. It was that I was proud and happy to be part of a system, a unified system with people here that are, for example, using the, uh, the Zoom technology to bring us to you. But everybody plays a role. Everybody is contributing, you know, and it's, it's the same thing in a team sport. You know, you, you have a system, you have the people that put the field out there. You have the people that maintain it. You have the coaches. You have the people that keep score. It's a team approach. And when you look at the system we have here at University of Arizona Global, for example, we have a culture of care. And I see caring in these photos and I see teaming. And that's what we want you to leave, leave you with here. And, you know, leading with empathy and compassion. And, you know, to me, I've had wonderful coaches that have boosted me and encouraged me, built my confidence, and all of a sudden I said, I can do that. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I was conscious I could do it. Then it was an unconscious thing where I just did it. And uh, so remember that with your students. Remember when you see a student struggling, they're looking up to you. So Marty, go ahead. Why don't you take this slide? Yeah. So basically, if we consider ourselves to be baseball managers, and so the manager in a baseball professional team, at least, uh, and, you know, throughout the ranks, is the person that is the head honcho on the team. Uh, this is the person that makes the decisions of who's gonna play, who's not gonna play, runs the practices and, and really tries to get the most out of, out of its people. And that's what we are as educators in the classroom. We are the managers of the classroom when we're trying to get the best from our students. And sometimes students need you know, punitive uh, actions to get them to, to start you know, getting on time and start actually working well. Others need encouragement and it's our job to find out which buttons we need to push with each player. There's a lot of analogies in sports about certain players being treated a, a special way. And a lot of that comes from the fact that they've earned special consideration and that's the way they get motivated. That's the way to keep them on the positive track. So if we draw out the baseball analogy a bit, uh, like the manager, you know, there's an old axiom in baseball that uh, pitching wins games. You have to have strong pitchers in order to have a good baseball team. If you don't have good pitching, doesn't matter how much hitting or defense you have, you're not going to win a lot of games. So if we compare the classroom to a baseball game, we have an opening pitch, which is a ceremonial first pitch where somebody that's not really part of the game, they come out and they throw that first pitch. And that's what we do in our classes before the classroom starts. We send out a warm introductory uh, email, uh, uh, announcement to our students, send an email to them, let them know that you're excited to, to go on this journey with them. Give them some information before the class starts uh, as far as where they need to go with, with guidance for that week. And so that's basically the ceremonial opening first pitch. And then you have opening day, the day the class starts. And your starting pitchers are your strongest pitchers. So in the early parts of the class, we really need to be on the top of our game as managers of the classroom, as instructors, to make sure that we are keeping the students engaged and that we're giving them our best effort so that they gain some momentum and enjoy the process and want to learn more as they go through the class. 
you hit the middle innings of a game, uh, the starting pitcher gets a little bit, you know, figured out by the batters, maybe third time around through the order, the hitters start figuring out what the ball is doing and the manager makes a decision to change things up a bit. We as instructors can do the same thing. If we've had heavily laden written uh, announcements, we might want to throw in a, an audio announcement or we might want to throw in an audio announcement into the discussion boards if we're not doing that on a re regular basis. Try to do something in the middle innings, you know, kind of like middle relief to make sure the students stay engaged and let them see something a little bit different. As we do this, don't forget to use humor in the classroom. It's really great for students to unexpectedly get a laugh uh, from some content rich areas. That's something that we really need to incorporate in the classroom because our goal always is as managers of the classroom is that our students learn the objectives for that class. They master the learning objectives, whatever they are, whether they be four to six to seven or eight, whatever the number is, so that as they build their content knowledge, when they get to the end of the program, they've learned all the things they need to learn and they're ready to go out in the world and apply those. So in the middle innings, you know, change things up a little bit. When we get to the end, in a baseball game, you end up with, you know, a really dominant pitcher called the closer. And this is really as an instructor, as a manager of the classroom, we need to be at the best in our game. As students have deadlines coming in, in my program, quite often it's a final project or a long final paper. And, you know, quite frankly, the students are a little tired from the first four or five weeks of the class, depending on whether it's an undergraduate or master's course. And going into that last week, we need to make sure that we're positive, encouraging, and that as a closer, we're coming in and we're showing them that they have the support they need to get ahead. And so if they're the hitters with the pitchers, we're trying to make sure that they're, you know, supported the way they need to be. They have a lot of energy going into the end. And so that's the analogy to baseball uh, as a manager for the classroom. And Bill, I think you can probably reach out about the CATS article and, and the foundations for technical, conceptual, and interpersonal skills that we need in the classroom to make students succeed. Absolutely, Marty. Thank, thank you very much for those analogies, those connections. We're seeing it. You look at these pictures, look at that coach in the bottom. He is sustaining their interest, right? Look at them smiles. He knows where he's bringing these, these players. He knows they're enjoying this and they're learning. And Marty, you, you did a great job uh, talking about the whole progression and what our goals are as educators to make sure they can master and understand and be comfortable with those uh, learning outcomes and, and all of that. So perfect, great job. Thank you for helping us see more. I'm going to talk about the three skills real quick and just touch them as we move through this. You know, the three skills that Robert Katz talks about in his research is that managers need, now think about this more as educator, and we'll talk about how technical skills apply. Technical skills, middle and lower levels in management, ability to perform various tasks, right? Educators have to do that. Um, managers who possess this skill understand it can use relevant tools, right? Marty talked about a video. He talked about changing it up. He talked about different kind of information. You know, you have to understand the context and the situation where you're at, but he talked about observation. He talked about touching and feeling and moving students through their learning continuum very positively. Uh, examples here, again, I mentioned a few, but they include technology, business planning, marketing, selling, negotiation expertise. Um, Marty, did I cover most of that pretty good? Yeah, and, and I just want to share, I literally just got it yesterday. So we, with instructors, we receive an end of course survey from our students where they tell us you know, what they think was great and what was bad about a course. And they often comment in writing, you know, written boxes with additional feedback about their instructors. And I had one student yesterday, a class I teach, um, a couple of the classes I teach have video components to them where the students have to go into the discussion board. They use this uh, function called Screencast-O-Matic, which quite often students have some technical issues initially trying to figure it out. And usually you can work with the student and they can get through it pretty well. But the student's comment was that they loved the class, but they didn't like the fact that they had to put videos into the classroom. And we shouldn't be challenging our students with technology. They should just be learning the content, which to me so missed the mark of what we're trying to do for our students, because obviously in online environment, we can't teach presentation skills, you know, one on one um, and live. That's not the, that's not what our model is. So the reason we do this is so I teach in criminal justice. So. Most often, if you're a manager in criminal justice, you're going to be doing a lot of presentations before a lot of groups. And the goal of this is to get them to learn the technology if they have to do a Zoom call and if they have to present and also to get them the speaking skills. As um, I remember from a great Jerry Seinfeld line, he said that uh, the number one fear of Americans is public speaking and the number two fear is death. 
So Jerry Seinfeld said, well, I guess the guy giving the eulogy is in a worse position than the guy in the box. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get our students over those things. And it just, it was such a contradiction to me that that was the complaint about the classroom when actually we're giving them a skill that they need. So, um, you know, technology is definitely something that's ever changing uh, and we need to keep up with it. And we're happy that we have tremendous support people here that I know are very patient because I contact them consistently trying to figure things out and get the, the most out of what I can from our technology. But with, with that, just, you know, the big thing is keeping an open mind and supporting people. And, and, you know, I probably didn't do a good enough job expressing the need for the student to, to gain those skills. So that's something I've learned and I'll, I'll pay more attention to that moving forward. Very good. And I like how you said patience, you know, uh, in our audience here, we have Stephanie Tweedy and she's just taught me many things with technology and moved me through that whole continuum. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate instructors that are patient with their students. And, you know, that's what we're all here for, furthering student success. I'm going to talk about just the concept. The next skill is the conceptual skill, the concept. Uh, I've always had, I believe, in business and in the, in the classroom, you know, I understood the situational variables, I understood the concept, the constructs, you know, what is it I need to do? And simply put, you know, managers who have conceptual skills are able to work well with ideas and concepts. You just heard Marty talk about different ideas and concepts and how to apply them. We're using um, metaphors and analogies here to baseball, just so you can put it together. Now, we don't expect you to remember everything we said, and and hopefully, hopefully we're making you feel good and you're making your students feel good. And hopefully you get some transfer and you connect the dots and a few of these ideas might come to you. And maybe you change something in your soft skills, maybe you do something different technically, but that's the value that we want to add to you. So managers think creatively, they understand situations, they see the big picture, they understand abstract ideas, and they understand cause and effect. If I do this, this could happen. This skill is important to strategic planning and business, and it helps managers set goals plans and strategies. And remember, you have goals in the classroom. Marty talked a little bit about um, the learning outcomes and so forth. That's our goal, student success, those aha moments. We want them to discover the learning and knowledge cycle, which is learning is an engaging process that results in knowledge, but the concept of knowledge is an ironic one. You can discover particular knowledge, claim it, possess it, but at the end of the learning process, it is invisible, right? You know you possess it if you can say, okay, I got it, but that doesn't make it visible. Your new knowledge does not become visible until you take action based upon it. Then it becomes concrete, visible to others, and fully owned for you to act on. We're all actors on a stage of knowledge every day, so apply what you learn, and, and, I, and I'd be remiss if I did not tell you where I got that quote, 2006, I taught EXP 105, that quote comes from Dr. Liz Tice. Uh, Dr. Mary Alexander and, and uh, her, Wayne Clugston, one of our founders. Matter of fact, um, that's in their book in 2009 that was updated uh, on learning online and achieving lifelong goals. So I thank them for that quote. I've carried that with me through my academic journey. Marty, any quick comment on this as we watch the time here and move if you'd like to make a comment on conceptual skills? Yes, yeah. And first of all, I'll make a technical correction for Mr. Davis here. It's Liz Crusen now, Dr. Liz Crusen. She used to be Dr. Liz Tice. So if you haven't been here for a decade or more, you wouldn't get that reference, but I'm just teasing you, Bill. That's good. Um, That's good. So, so when we think about you know, managers and the big picture, if we relate it back to baseball in the professional game, there are 162 games in the regular season, and then there can be you know any number of games in the playoffs if your team can get that far. And seeing the big picture for a manager is really a big deal in baseball because as a fan, I'm going to sit there and invest two and a half hours to watch a game. And if it's a Red Sox-Yankees game, it's going to be four to four and a half hours of my life. And regardless of where the team is at during the season, whether we're good or bad, I want my team to win that game. I want them to bring in the best players to win that one game because that's the most important thing in the world to me. Well, as the manager, you know, they're looking at, you know what, I don't have a starting pitcher three days from now if I burn this guy out. So I'm going to, you know, make some changes and I'm going to do some things that people aren't necessarily going to be happy with. Don't think it's the best move, but in the long term, in the big picture, it's the best move. We can relate that to the classroom. Student does really poorly on a paper and complains and doesn't understand why they did poorly. And, you know, they want to, you know, regrade, uh, uh, they want to resubmit it, they want to regrade it. We can allow that to happen, uh, or we can choose not to. If you think that you were talking about dealing with people differently, you think this student was, you know, procrastinating, didn't have a valid excuse why a paper was so late and poorly done, you might say, you know what, 
I'd rather you focus going forward. I'd rather you take this penalty. You're learning a consequence. There are consequences for our actions, and this is one of those for you. Whereas another student, you know, I didn't get a hold of you because I had X, Y, or Z happen in my life. I've been doing well in the class. You believe that student and you say, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll give you a chance to rewrite the paper. So we have to make those kind of value and judgment decisions as instructors and as managers, seeing the bigger picture again of getting that student to progress, getting them to understand what they need from that class so that they have the foundation to move forward in their careers and in their educational goals. Very, very good, Marty. Students matter and we know that and that's why we're here and that's why we exist to make them better. Now, human relations, interpersonal skills, you know, we're, you're seeing a lot of that in the dialogue here that Marty and I are having. And, um, you know, just understand, you know, be lead with EQ, be self-aware, self-manage, manage relationships, also be socially aware of what's in front of you in your classrooms. Baseball managers are, coaches are, educators are when you can understand how, how a student learns best you can you can relate to them but that's what this is all about relating to people and being cognizant of, of your own views which i mentioned be self-aware as well as the views of others be aware of your biases having a strong self and social awareness means that you have eq i mentioned eq lead with eq coach with eq lead with empathy and compassion understand students you you know your classrooms but remember you're dealing with people and students don't care a lot of times how much you know till they know how much you care so set the tone um, managers can effectively manage relationships they build trust right they create an environment that fosters communication and inclusiveness be an inclusive leader in the classroom which is a key to strategic planning and vision creation but have a vision in your classroom marty i'll give you we're headed to the end here i'm going to give you a minute here if you want to make a comment well you just reinforce what you said of dealing with the student where he or she comes from the it's easy for us to say well this was the deadline you know you needed to hit it our five week and six week courses on our master's programs go quickly. We need to be sympathetic and empathetic with our students. And again, keep the, you know, drop our egos, keep our goal in mind of getting them through the, the learning objectives for the course. And, and that's, that's the primary focus of what we want. That's how we win the game. There you go. Thank you. And you know, again, some images, right? Pictures worth a thousand words. What do you see in these photos? You see positivity, you see learning, you see connectedness, you see success, right? motivation always be aware of your emotions because they affect your motivations they affect how you behave and they affect how you perform so if you're positive and you're looking at this realistically optimistically aware of that and realizing that i'm going to give my very best i hope you see we gave you some ideas here we put our very best out here in front of you and we encourage you to be good coaches marty i'm going to give you 60 seconds here to go ahead and uh, close us out if you would please basically we just like to encourage everybody to always have a new focus in what they're doing they never get stagnant in your presentations there's always new ways to to find to connect with students to make sure that they go ahead and they are actually achieving what you want them to achieve and do it together uh, we are not sitting on high you know on the top of the the mountain you know eliciting and and, and providing people with you know the sage knowledge and these tablets that they have to learn from. The reason Bill and I continue to teach is we learn as much from our students, if not more than they learn from us. So engage the learning experience, manage your classrooms in ways that are new and exciting and make sure you keep your eye on the prize, winning the game and getting the students to master those learning objectives. Thank you all. Absolutely, and thank, thank you all very much. There's our emails. If you have any questions you wanna engage us, we, we might've went a little too long than we wanted. We wanted to save a little time for Q&A, so we apologize, but send any questions you may have to us. Here's our emails, and thank you very much for listening. And Meg, I think we hit the time that we were supposed to be, am I correct? I, I think we have another 15 minutes. Oh, that's good. Then, then, then yes. I'm wrong. I'm thinking and 15 after. I know you did, did a tremendous job. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, let's do this. That gives us an opportunity to open up the floor. So we're gonna we're gonna dance here. We're gonna adjust. So I, I, my apologies. I was thinking we were headed to the end. So is there anything in this uh, to the audience here? You've got to chat. Is there anything that you would like to go back and talk about? Um, what maybe it's about leader coaching. Maybe it's about, um, you know, any part of this, you know, human interpersonal skill, what might have worked best. Let me ask a question to everyone out there. 
um, how have how have you succeeded teaching, leading, coaching with emotional intelligence? Anyone? How has it helped you to be more self-aware of, of how you approach students, how your students are behaving in your classrooms? It, you know. Well, one thing I think that um, all of us have dealt with and need to be aware of is the the dangers of burnout. Particularly during the pandemic, we've all been overloaded, stressed out <laughs> to make so many immediate changes and that can impact our teaching. I, I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Thank, thank you, Meg. And you know, the, the, the pandemic challenged everyone and we all have gone through a lot and, and we see situations and as, as Marty talked about, you know, working with students, giving them that opportunity to continue supporting them. Um, how many here use, are, are from UAGC that might use our helpline? I know I use it all the time. If I see a student that I think needs additional support. How many, how many um, have allowed students to possibly do a rewrite if, if or to continue on with us with an assignment marty i know you have an interesting story you, you have a wonderful story to share would you like to just top line that real quick sure i sometimes you know people lately i haven't heard it but when i first started teaching quite often there were instructors that we had here and other institutions i've worked in this was probably like the seventh or eighth institution i've taught with that would judge the students negatively and say, well, they're just looking to get their degree. They're not really committing to the class. I think there was a lot of ego involved in those type of assessments that we, you know, well, when I was in school, my teachers didn't help me do X, Y, or Z. I had to do it by myself. Was that the best approach? You know, just because that's what we experienced, does that mean it was it was right? Or, or you know, there's a lot of examples in history when things were considered to be right that certainly aren't when we become a little bit more enlightened. But just to support the fact that our students are dedicated, I had a student in my classroom that was extremely intelligent. She was doing great throughout the class. We get to the last week of the class and she says, well, I'm sorry, but I need to ask for an extension of time to file my final paper. And I said, hey, no problem, you know, whatever it is, it's fine. You know, how much time do you need? What's good for you? Because she had established that trust with me throughout the class. She, she was always on top of things and, and doing very well. And she said, well, I uh, have just been admitted to hospice. And but I'm going to work on my degree and I'm going to get my degree because I'm going to show my five year old daughter that I can do this. So if we judge people and say, you know, well, no extensions or I'm, I'm not, I'm going to take off all kinds of penalties because you're a little bit late with something without listening to the students, then we're going to be discouraging people that, you know, quite frankly, need some support and some help. I, I, I am still blown away with her dedication to doing this. It, it, it amazes me because I think the last thing I would be doing if, if I had to be dealing with, um, you know, if I had to be dealing with going through hospice would be concerned about getting my undergraduate paper done for, for a class that I'm taking online. So um, let's not, you know, go in judging our students and questioning their, their motivations because once we get to know our students, that they're all going through a lot. I, I couldn't imagine, I, I was blessed enough to be able to go to college full-time, I was able to go to law school full-time and not have to worry about, you know, children, uh, career, um, paying bills, all that kind of thing. So, you know, we, we need to show some grace in the classroom and, and that's what you do. And that's, if we're going back to baseball, that's what a good manager does. Like I, we talked about before, some people need a kick in the butt and some people need support and love and, and, and understanding. So, you know, getting to that point and getting to know our students in, in a short amount of time can be challenging, but it's worth it. And the, the feedback we get from students when they've gotten through the program is, is, is really worth it. It's very rewarding. Absolutely. And, you know, just wonderful to see them succeed. And <clears throat> I know I've had many examples, you know, especially military students, too, that are um, being deployed or in a situation. And I always extend my care. I always extend um, a solution. I always extend a plan. 
I let them know that I'm here. We care for you. We're in this together. We'll work it out. Even if I have to go outside of the classroom and catch them up on a Zoom session or whatever we need to do, I want to build that confidence. I want to build that self-efficacy. I want them to succeed. That's why we're here. And uh, and it is a process, you know, and I'm, I'm reminded when I did the Adopt-a-School program here in my community and I would go and read to students in the elementary program, I got to know some of the um, uh, principals in the area and so forth. And I got invited to a breakfast once. And I never forgot this. The, uh, the head superintendent had the mic and he was talking, uh, superintendent of schools, and he said, and I, I never forgot, he said, before the rest, your attitude must pass the test. And I always remember that and I took that away and I always thought about, you know, the, the, the three attributes for success. You know, are you ready for them? Attitude, attitude, attitude. And that comes from Dr. Laura Palmer Noon. She's our former provost. And that's something that I took from her and I've applied and I keep it out in my forefront, but I do consider my attitude to be my greatest asset. So I want, I want to be positive. I want to support students. And if you look at this photo, again, you see support, you see, you see teamwork, you see, just like in baseball, you see, thank you. You know, a player hits a home run, comes back to the dugout, the whole team is high-fiving them. You know, and if you look at a classroom and you succeed, celebrate the milestones. That's one thing that I always told my students as they were moving toward their degree. Keep your eye on the prize and celebrate every milestone along the way and write your courses down and continue. Be in the moment. Be in the moment with your students and show caring. They'll, they'll remember that. Students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when you're with them, that whole learning experience is meaningful and gratifying and it's even better. So, yeah, um, and Bill, Bill, I've got a supplement too to, to what Meg was bringing up about avoiding burnout. When I started my education journey, I actually left you know trial work and worked for the University of Phoenix as staff counsel for about a year. And while I was there, they were just getting to the point of launching their nationwide online criminal justice program. So I was able to be the first associate dean of that program, help them develop it and get it launched. But when I was working there as a lawyer, um, Bill Papicella was the provost of the University of Phoenix at the time, great guy. And he had asked me to do something for him. I, I don't remember what it was, some kind of state licensure question that he had for something. And he wanted it by Thursday. I'll never forget, he wanted it Thursday by five o'clock. Well, I ended up with a bunch of fires that you know had to take priority Wednesday and during the day Thursday, and I just couldn't get to what he asked me to do. It wasn't that big of a deal. It was probably you know two or three hours at worst to, to figure out and answer his questions. But it got to be about 4.30 and I was just starting to sit down to do what he did and I knew I wouldn't get it done by five. So I went walking into his office, you know, hat in hand at like 4.40 p.m. And now I came from a, an appellate and trial background where deadlines are extremely important. You don't miss deadlines. You're, you know, you always show up, you're, you're never late. You know, it's the old uh, adage of if you're earlier on time, if you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're dead. That totally applies to trial work and to appellate work. And I went into his office and it was, you know, it was about 440. I'll never forget. And I said, oh, you know, Bill, I said, I know you wanted that research, but I'm sorry. You know, I had a bunch of stuff happen the last couple of days. I can't get to it, but I'll stick around. You know, I'll have it to you by seven or eight. Hopefully, you know, it's not too late for you a couple hours. And he, he's sitting at his desk and, he, and I'm standing there and he looks at me. And he goes, Marty, sit down. And so I sat down and he looks at me and he goes, Marty, this is education. No one's dying here. Go home, play with your kids, do it tomorrow. It's okay. And I, I think if we can keep that perspective with our students too, you know, I've had students that where they, I've just got so much going on. I'll get it to you tomorrow. And I said, you know what? Unplug for a day. You know, it, it was due, you know, yesterday, today's Tuesday. It was due yesterday. Get it to me Thursday or Friday. You know, just let your brain breathe and, and take some time. And I've, I've used that line a million times. This is education. You know, don't get too excited. Don't get too, this is education. No one's dying here. So I, I think if we can keep that perspective, we'll, we'll uh, have better outcomes for our students, which is how we win the games again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, dreams and goals do come true. They just take time and we're helping students move through time, move through their, their learning journey. And, and what an honor that is to share in their learning journey. Just remember the important role that we all play and that they're, they're, a lot of times they're mirroring our reaction, especially if they're in distress. You know, two types of stress, you stress, distress. Uh, you stress is good stress. You know when somebody's moving forward. But sometimes, like Meg said, there's there's COVID, there's situations, they're balancing roles, 
we have to be sensitive to that. We got to be in tune to that. And we got to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to make that a meaningful and gratifying learning experience. With that said, um, we're going to give you back a little bit of time, Meg, if that's okay. And uh, we want to thank you very, very much for being a part of this. And Marty, any final thoughts? Well, I, I, this wouldn't be official unless I end it with go Sox. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sad to say, I'm the one who will have the last word. But <laughs> my last word. <laughs> we appreciate it. Yeah, your last word. Actually, what I like is uh, a, a plan is a dream with a timetable. Or a, you could say a goal is a dream with a timetable. Either works. But, Thank you. Yeah. Very uh, nice thank you me. very much, uh, Bill and Marty, for your tremendous presentation. Thank you for sharing all those ideas. And for everyone, uh, please be sure to complete the conference evaluation. This is uh, important to our organization and gives you an opportunity to tell us what you like and what you might like to see in the future. So thank you all and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.